Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this uh, webinar on mandatory human rights due diligence organized by the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. My name is Marlene Out and I am based in Stockholm for the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. Uh, Stockholm's very cold and windy and even a little bit snowy today, but nevertheless, I wish you a very, very warm welcome to this uh, timely seminar uh, on, on a topic close to, to my heart or, or brain at least. Uh, so last year uh, in 2020, the European Union announced that it would adopt a directive on mandatory human rights due diligence for companies. This decision, which was motivated by uh, the need to prevent human rights abuses and environmental harm, took many by surprise. And with this webinar series, we will explore where this initiative is coming from, what it's likely to lead to, and what are the limits of uh, due diligence as a tool to protect human rights in global supply chains. In a series of three webinars, starting today uh, and with the second one in May and the third one in June, we will look at regulatory precedents and the ongoing European debate to see what the sticking points are and the major choices. Then we'll discuss uh, mandatory human rights due diligence in the context of the regulatory ecos ecosystem surrounding supply chains, including in relation to forthcoming and existing trade and investment agreements, as well as multi-stakeholder initiatives on CSR. And finally, we will try to understand what these mean for the EU, for Sweden as promoters of value-based trade in a time of geopolitical, technological, and environmental change. During this first of the three webinars, we will discuss the momentum for mandatory human rights due diligence in the EU. So what made the EU and its member states uh, to act? Why do some businesses support a law on human rights due diligence instead of sticking to voluntary approaches to corporate social responsibility? And what are the key parameters and controversial issues in the current drafts from the European Parliament? With us to discuss these very complex and interesting issues, we have an extremely insightful panel with representatives both from uh, government, from business, from academia and NGOs. Uh, our first panelist is my colleague, Radim, who's a senior researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. Uh, he's specialized in the area of business and human rights with a focus on multinational enterprises and global supply chains. Uh, I want to introduce all the panelists first uh, before I hand over the floor to Radu to kick us off. Our second panelist is Cecilia Ekholm, who was recently appointed Ambassador for Sustainable Business at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Sweden. Her areas as ambassador include promoting the Swedish government's sustainable business agenda in collaboration with relevant actors. Uh, she is chairperson of the Swedish National Contact Point and a representative in the DRI government advisory board. And she was previously posted as ambassador to Peru. Then we have Olga Martin Ortega, who's a professor of international law at the School of Law at the University of Greenwich in the UK. She's been researching business and human rights for over 10 years with a focus on post-conflict reconstruction, transitional justice, and international criminal law. She's advised the EU Parliament on mandatory human rights due diligence regulation, and is currently working with the ILO on fair labor recruitment and human rights. She's also uh, on the board of trustees of Electronics Watch and on the advisory board of the International Learn Learning Lab on procurement and human rights. And then finally, we have Greg Priest, who is the head of human rights and social impact at Inter IKEA Group. He has over 20 years experience working with business sustainability and human rights. 
In his current role, he oversees the development of strategy and initiatives to support human rights integration into business practices, while also supporting advocacy to influence positive change through legislation, regulation, standard setting, and industry influence. And he's been a board member on several global industry-related initiatives. So the way we'll do this webinar is that I will ask the four panelists to make brief introductory remarks, and then we will have at least 15 minutes for Q&A and discussion with the audience. So please, audience, if you have any questions that you would like to pose uh, to the panel, please enter your questions in the Q&A function. Now, let's get started. Radu, please, can you kick off the discussions by introducing us to the EU's CSR journey from voluntarism to mandatory human rights due diligence? Radu. Thank you, Marlene, and uh, with pleasure. And uh, greetings to the fellow panelists and to everybody tuning in in our webinar. And uh, I will uh, give you a snapshot uh, and a summary of how the EU have moved on these issues in the last 20 years, basically a chronology of the main events. And uh, after that, I will reflect on some turning points that have really transformed this uh, debate. So EU started on CSR around uh, 20 years ago when the European uh, Parliament uh, proposed in a report back in 99 to set up a code of conduct for European multinational enterprises. You remember this was the time in the 90s when we had the, the scandals of Shell in Nigeria, Nike in Asia, and the start of the UN Global Compact um, in 2000. Uh, the Commission, after receiving this report, decided that there was enough guidance for uh, multinational enterprises and there was no need for a European code. So instead, the, the Commission decided that uh, it's uh, preferable to support current uh, guidance documents and also implement uh, them through a CSR strategy. Uh, in this uh, line of thought, they, uh, they published papers, green papers 2001, and then white papers, more authoritative papers 2002, 2006, and 2011, the last one. Also, the EU set up a European multi-stakeholder forum on CSR and the European Alliance for CSR. These were based on ideas of partnership and collaborative learning. But quite, quite few felt that these initiatives didn't deliver those uh, uh, lasting transformative impacts uh, uh, the Commission was waiting for. The last paper came in 2011, the year of the UN Guiding Principles, and the paper expired in 2014, and it was never renewed. However, you can find in 2019, the last document from the Commission on CSR it's a working document for the staff. And it's quite long and it provides an overview about what the EU is doing on CSR by 2019. Uh, as Balin said, by uh, uh, 2020, the, the EU surprised uh, many and the Justice Commissioner announced that the Commission would propose a mandatory due diligence uh, instrument covering human rights and the environment. And uh, following that, um, the European Parliament issued two reports giving guidance to the Commission uh, what the content, what the parameters of due diligence should be. So these are the reports from September 2020 and from March 2021 from the European Parliament. Now it is expected the Commission will put forward the draft uh, as early as June. And there is no certainty that the Commission will follow the recommendations of the Parliament. Quite often they do not, so they might come with a totally different draft. So that's in a nutshell the, the chronology, if you want, of the, of the last uh, 20 years. But what would be some of the turning points in this uh, 20 years uh, journey? Because we see the EU moving from uh, no standard setting ambitions and uh, a definition of CSR as a purely voluntary approach, uh, all the way to now when the discussion is about a directive, an instrument on mandatory human rights due diligence. 
what uh, what explains what contextualizes some of these uh, shifts in the EU approach? I would start by saying that in 2011, in the last CSR paper, the uh, European Commission changed the definition of CSR in a fundamental way. Uh, the first 10 years uh, since 2001. Um, uh, the Commission explained uh, CSR as an integration of all kinds of impacts on a voluntary basis. So purely voluntary approach to CSR. In 2011, uh, the, the Commission started to contemplate regulation. So they understood CSR as a business-led approach that is backed up by complementary legislation. That is a smart mix of measures adopted by public authorities. And this redefinition was uh, heavily influenced by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights from 2011. Professor John Raghi there explained that CSR requires a smart mix of measures and he emphatically rejected what he called the red herring, the voluntary versus mandatory approach to CSR. He said we need both. And this redefinition of CSR brought the Commission and the European Parliament in line when it came to CSR, because the Parliament for quite some years demanded transparency legislation. The second turning point uh, was this understanding that voluntarism and even transparency laws have limits. And these limits have become uh, more evident and more widely recognized, especially in 2020, when two massive studies were published by the European Commission, one of them being on due diligence. So uh, there was this uh, widespread also unanimous almost uh, skepticism regarding transparency laws like the non-financial reporting directive from 2014, whether this can really alter business conduct on a sufficient scale. The third uh, uh, turning point I think would be what happened at the EU member states level. What we see was that a number of states started to adopt their own national mandatory human rights due diligence laws. France did that in 2017. Netherlands followed in 2019. Germany is doing it right now. And there was legislative process in uh, Switzerland as well as in Finland. So that made it quite pressing for the EU to harmonize these existing uh, laws and in this way to facilitate the internal market and level the playing field for European businesses. And finally, I would say that uh, there is the European uh, Green Deal. This is appeared because of the urgency of the climate crisis and the COVID crisis. And it shows that the European Union is uh, willing to experiment with a new business model. And that's not a radical departure from the current models, but it's if you want the enlightened shareholder model of business. Um, and that has to do with um, uh, just transition. Uh, so of course the EU um, aims at the model of growth that is green and digital, but this uh, transition to this new model should be a just transition leaving no one behind. So this would be in a nutshell um, what happened in the EU in the last 20 years um, with some very brief explanations and contextualization of some of the turning points. Perfect, Radu. And thank you so much for keeping within the time and introducing, I mean, this very complex and, and actually rather dry topic, uh, nerdy topic, as we said before. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that so vividly. I want to hand straight over to uh, Cecilia now to uh, see a little bit about where Sweden stands on this issue. Uh, is, is Sweden supportive of mandatory human rights due diligence? And if so, why? And where does this law fit in uh, in the Swedish context of, of a smart mix of, of measures? Over to you, Cecilia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marlene, and thank you to the Raal Wallenberg Institute for inviting me to talk about the Swedish smart mix and how the EU legislation would fit in. So let me start from where you ended, Marlene. You ended with the smart mix. And let me say a couple of words on what the smart mix for Sweden looks like today. 
and then why uh, we, well, the government, no surprise, is supportive of a legislative proposal on EU level, and something about what the government thinks should come out of, uh, of that proposal. So starting with the smart mix, I know that a number of people who are listening here today are, are well versed, but for others, it might be a, a new topic. So uh, the smart mix that Radu referred to in, in Swedish terms, just very, very briefly, would be a policy framework. And the policy framework for Sweden is the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights that was adopted in 2015. We were the sixth country in the world to do so. This action plan has been evaluated in 2018, and the findings were partially incorporated into the grand policy document that we have today, which is the Swedish platform for international sustainable business. Another part is reporting. Uh, Radu mentioned non-financial reporting, but we can also add the support to the global uh, reporting initiative that Sweden is the, is the largest backer of that uh, free reporting tools for companies. Uh, obviously state action, domestic as well as external. When it comes to domestic action, just uh, as an example, the work the government is doing with the state-owned companies who have the state-owned enterprises who have uh, quite specific requirements when it comes to business and human rights. When it comes to external action, uh, business and human rights is featured in our export finance uh, agencies as well as in our export promotion activities, development assistance, and obviously in our multilateral engagements, uh, such as with the OECD and the UN. Uh, there are voluntary initiatives within the smart mix from civil society and the private sector. And uh, another part is remedy, uh, where you can have uh, uh, legislation that uh, fulfills the obligation, for example, of the human rights treaties that Sweden has acceded to, as well as uh, grievance mechanisms such as the national contact point, which is connected to the OECD guidelines on multinational companies. And then, of course, there is legislation. And now there is a proposal on EU legislation. And the government is positive when it comes to EU legislation. And why? Well, first of all, an EU level legislation will encompass more countries and more companies. Today, there are 16 EU member states who have a national action plan on business and human rights. So an EU level legislation will get more people on board, more companies and more countries on board. Secondly, it will send a strong signal that these are important EU values and the EU can be seen as a trailblazer uh, and, and um, going ahead uh, of the rest, which means that the pressure, uh, the, the weight that you get from an EU initiative is far heavier than you would be able to get from a national initiative. Harmonized rules and requirements, uh, Radu mentioned the single market. So what we're hoping is, of course, if we have harmonized rules and requirements, because many companies, many EU companies are active in many EU markets. That means if they can focus on having the similar or same rules and requirements, it might be less of a, a box ticking exercise and actually being able to focus more on the result because you don't have to abide by 27 different rules, you can abide by one. And then you can focus your resources in the right way. And the last one is that it gives greater scope for collaboration. So a greater scope for collaboration, especially in high risk sectors, can be very effective. Lastly, uh, when it comes to the government's view, and the government has been very transparent. There was a uh, consultation process in the EU where uh, companies and organizations, other stakeholders, as well as government could send in uh, the views. So the Swedish, com the Swedish government has, uh, has uh, published uh, what we sent in to the commission. So I won't go into detail here, but you can find the information on the government website in English. But suffice to say that uh, the government, the Swedish government, is positive when it comes to EU legislation and wants to see an ambitious legislation. It should be based in international law and the multinational, the multilateral instruments that we've spoken about, the UN guiding principles, as well as the OECD guidelines for multinational companies. It should cover all sectors and all sizes, but with specific reporting requirements for small and medium enterprises. 
uh, it should also be um, it should also cover third country companies, and there should be a system for follow up, including access to remedy. So the way forward, we still believe there will be an uh, an EU legislative proposal in June, uh, and from then on we will uh, we will look at that. Uh, we do this work in dialogue with stakeholders. So we have a specific reference group that incorporates civil society, trade unions, and private sector representatives. And we also have an intergovernment because this is work that will, uh, that will not only be uh, held in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, but it actually uh, encompasses many ministries. So we have an interdepartmental working group. So we work across uh, the government, uh, the government ministries, and all sectors can be involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. That's very clear. Uh, I, I had one quick uh, follow-up question before I hand over to to our next speaker, Olga, and that is, I mean, this has been a, 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 at least a ten-year process, and there's been lots of discussion. So I was wondering what, has, has the Swedish government always been supportive of this legislation? What have some of the issues for, for debate or the hesitations been, been around? Uh, if you could say uh, something about that. I, I wouldn't say there's been any hesitation on EU level because we already we have EU level sectoral legislation on due diligence. And Sweden was one of the most ambitious and engaged negotiators when it came to the conflict mineral regulation. There has been a discussion when it comes to national legislation, and that has more to do with the fact that it seems has seemed to be less efficient uh, to have a national legislation than to have an EU legislation. I see. Very good. Thank you. And on, on one of your uh, last points, I'll, I'll, it's a good segue into Olga's presentation on, on consulting stakeholders and, and having stakeholder processes. So, Olga, I know you have vast experience with different NGOs and multi-stakeholder initiatives. Can you talk a bit about opportunities for stakeholder participation and access to information through mandatory human rights due diligence, please? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, to the Raoul Wallenberg Institute for the invitation, and thank you very much to my very esteemed uh, colleague uh, Radu Maras for his invitation. When when you were uh, exposing uh, so clearly uh, and uh, and succinctly the journey that the EU has um, undertaken, uh, Radu, this brought me back to this twenty years journey that we've had. That has been a parallel journey into um, researching the uh, ways to make companies accountable and one of the elements that I'm, I'm concerned with in my research and in my uh, as you said uh, Maling in my practical work with um, with civil society is what is the role of the stake of what we call generally stakeholders and who are these stakeholders so um, I, I want to first say that you know that I've worked with the with the parliament as, as I um, advising through the process and uh, this was something that was very important for for myself and my colleague uh, Claire Methven O'Brien who uh, um, worked with me in the policy uh, paper that we wrote for the parliament um, on this role of the stakeholder but a meaningful sustainable uh, and meaningful uh, and effective role so that I were very happy to see that the parliament uh, uh, in this proposal does provide for enhanced spaces for um, stakeholders, so, uh, as you would see in the directive uh, um, draft uh, that is proposed, which, as uh, Radu has said, there's no no guarantees that would end up uh, being um, uh, taken. Defines the stakeholder as uh, all those individuals, groups uh, or group uh, individuals and groups that are affected, and they list and it lists workers, their representatives, lo local communities, children, indigenous people, citizens of trade unions, civil society organizations, and undertaken stakeholders. In my own personal research, I've worked very much on public procurement and the role of the state from another perspective, the role of the state from an um, a, you know, economic agent, uh, economic actor that gets involved with undertakings, not just as the a regulator, but as well as the, as the agent for change through 
um, uh, public procurement. And I personally think it's a missed opportunity not to have included uh, the institutional consumer and have a much more fair role for the consumer in general. But as you see, this enhances spaces and references for stakeholder, uh, stakeholder participation are um, uh, very central to the uh, uh, Parliament proposal. I, uh, I want to uh, you know, have a, this look at, at what you've mentioned, the, the role of information, the, what uh, I've called with uh, some colleagues that I've worked with on this uh, from civil society, in this case with Good Electronics, the Good Electronics Network, on the right to know. We have transparency, we've, we've had non-financial um, uh, non uh, information disclosure laws, we have the UK Modern Slavery Act, that's where I'm based in the UK, et cetera. And, uh, and we've always had communication and transparency as an element of, the, of human rights of Golden. So it's a key element, um, communication is a key element in the EU and Biden principle, and now in these national laws. However, the way uh, transparency has been defined until now is very much a corporate-led, corporate-defined transparency. Corporations have been able to report on what uh, the, the a specific of their choosing, uh, uh, very much so obviously on the topics, so either uh, very defined topics such as modern slavery, human trafficking, or more generally, um, uh, as in the EU, EU non-financial reporting directive. But what we're uh, suggesting uh, from this um, uh, platform of civil society that I've uh, mentioned, uh, Good Electronics, is a state, uh, is, sorry, a human rights approach to transparency. So when we talk about a human rights approach, we have to identify duty bearers and right holders. So duty bearers in this right human rights to transparency is this right to know our states and corporations. It's not a, uh, it's not, um, a choice of uh, corporations of what specifically they have to uh, report on, what they have to disclose. It's an obligation. And it is the right of uh, um, workers and workers and their representatives, workers and uh, other stakeholders, always considering that the right is for those who are affected by these commercial relationships and who are affected by um, uh, the uh, corporate activity. So this, uh, I think it's very good that in the, in the draft, the kids, they will keep on coming to workers, trade unions and their representatives. We tend to forget that, uh, um, that there are many countries where we don't have uh, by the, the trade unions which are truly representatives or um, if they are, they are um, uh, they face a lot of obstacles to actually um, represent the workers in the formal processes. So a right to know is the, is the right that has its grounds and legal grounds in international law, international human rights law, international labor rights law, labor rights, uh, labor law, sorry, but in national laws as well as part of civil liberties, as part of the Freedom of Information Act that we have in many countries, and as part of uh, consumer law and public administration. Its content is, as I said, all the information that affects and impacts the capacity for uh, the stakeholders, the, the, uh, the right holders to exercise their human rights. And, but it also has an important uh, formal aspect, which is accessibility. It's information that is able to be analyzed, it's aggregated in a manner that uh, uh, makes it possible for these uh, right holders to actually exercise their rights. This, sometimes I refer it to death by transparency. So some corporations are, are very willing to um, disclose and they, you know, they kind of uh, push us uh, uh, with a massive PDF that it's very difficult um, to disaggregate, even though it has very lovely pictures of very happy uh, people in its cover normally. So when I, you know, I, it, so I see very, uh, this draft in particular as a, a very interesting draft for um, opportunities uh, for these um, for these enhanced spaces and these enhanced procedures that should be uh, able to provide stakeholders with a meaningful role. Um, I just uh, I'll just point uh, um, to a couple of very interesting elements there. Um, having said that, I think mandatory human rights indulgence. It's very important, uh, obviously, but we cannot forget that mandatory cannot substitute substantive human rights indulgence, material human rights indulgence. 
if we even if we make it uh, uh, mandatory that uh, companies um, report and establish uh, plans, uh, strategies, and diligence, it's not uh, uh, much change as if uh, we just continue with the mandatory uh, non -dis uh, mandatory disclosure. It needs to be sustained. So um, very quickly, with regards to uh, the interesting points of this uh, draft are uh, to do with monitoring, uh, in which uh, we have stakeholders involved in supervision, stakeholders involved in uh, communication, publication, evaluation, and review of the due diligence strategy. But uh, more uh, interestingly, we have uh, uh, stakeholders involved in previous mechanisms in the remediation and actually in the enforcement capacity of the state. Just in my last 10 seconds, I want to make a big shout out to the Norwegian um, uh, Initiative for uh, Transparency Act. It establishes an obligation to disclose on demand, as uh, Mark Taylor has um, uh, pointed at it, and I obligate and a right to demand corporate information. And I'll leave it here because I can see my eight uh, minutes has just come up. Thank you very much, Marlene. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Olga. That was a very clear uh, illustration of what a human rights-based approach actually entails in terms of, of accessibility and a meaningful role. Uh, so thank you so much for that. I like the, the concept of death by transparency. Uh, with that, I, I will hand over to uh, Greg Priest at InterIKEA. Uh, Greg, could you tell us a bit about how you see InterIKEA, but also companies in general, how they've reasoned about this new EU directive and why some companies have come out in, in public support um, of, of this legislation? Uh, and, and what were the internal discussions uh, leading up to, uh, to IKEA taking this position? What, what were the internal discussions like at, at IKEA? Right, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation of, uh, to the Institute uh, and to my, for my panelists and everybody who's joining today. I think it's a, a fantastic discussion. Um, and maybe to frame it a little bit, it would be good to give you a little bit of context of the Inter-IKEA group, what, what that means. Um, we are the, the, the owner of the IKEA concept. Um, there are 12 um, franchisees, retailers uh, within the uh, IKEA network that, uh, you know, the stores that you visit uh, throughout the world. Um, the Inter-IKEA group is responsible for designing, developing all of the range of products you see when you visit the stores. Um, we're also responsible for the supply chain of products um, to our retailers. We have our own industry group. So you can see where the discussions today, you know, that it's very relevant for us, uh, really in all aspects uh, that we've discussed. And I'll probably actually repeat some of the things that um, some of the other panelists have talked about, because, I mean, we see very similar things as we're, as we're going through the proposed legislation. Um, we, we start with the vision at IKEA to create a better everyday life for the many people. So when you talk about, you know, working with social, environmental, human rights questions, we've really been doing that for many years. It was interesting to hear Radu talk about, you know, the first concepts of developing an EU code of conduct for business. Um, because ours goes back almost exactly the same time, introduced in 2000. So it's been kind of 20 years, uh, 20 plus years of working you know, and before that, but, you know, really kind of systemically and systematically with it. Um, and we have very much supported this, you know, elusive smart mix of mandatory voluntary initiatives. We, we've been part of the consultation process. Uh, we submitted the statements uh, in support of it, along with, you know, some, we have some experience, so some ideas of how to work with the different components of the legislation. And we were also part of a collective statement of 11 other companies who are part of um, our Nordic Business Network for Human Rights that came out in support of it. Now, I, I, I don't pretend to talk for every business because there are different businesses who see different aspects of it, but there are, I think there is a large um, contingent of businesses that who see this as a positive thing. Um, you know, so I get asked that question. Well, you know, why would you want to support, and why would IKEA, Inter-IKEA Group, want to support 
uh, legislation as opposed to just voluntary initiatives. Well, if you think back to the, you know, the adoption of the guiding principles 2011, many businesses have been working you know, with integrating, implementing processes for respecting human rights throughout their business. Uh, the strength, of course, of the UNGPs was to provide this, uh, this global framework, or this international framework, so that we could really understand how we can work with this, the elements of due diligence, um, what that means, reporting, uh, all of the different aspects. And then these have been supported by, you know, different voluntary initiatives and been integrated into different external initiatives as well. I think we feel now that good legislation can really, I mean, this word harmonization comes back again and again, but I think that's really important. Um, good legislation that sets really a harmonized way of working. We can really increase, you know, the amount of, you know, positive impact that business can have throughout, you know, its operations. Then from an EU perspective, we talked about, you know, the internal markets, ways of working, um, but I think that it can also be a really a, a benchmark for the rest of the world, you know, to, you know, hopefully, increase, you know, raise the bars into different initiatives. Um, we've also heard a few times today this, you know, term level playing field. And I think this can be, can almost be seen as negatively very defensive in a sense, you know, but there is an importance of setting consistent expectations on all companies, especially, you know, legal certainty that we just really know, you know, what is expected of us. But then, you know, there is a real advantage of having this, common language uh, between companies, ways of working, expectations. You know, we all have business relationships within the EU and then past the EU. So if we can have that common expectation of ways of working, that will just you know, make us much more efficient and effective in all aspects of the business. And I think it will you know, increase the effectiveness of the, of the voluntary initiatives, make them more robust. We can integrate them into different uh, processes into different initiatives that we have. So, I mean, some of the benefits I've, you know, just touched on as well, but, you know, as a company, we, you know, we have opportunity. We have size, scope, uh, to influence social change. We have people throughout the value chain. And I think that's maybe important as well, because sometimes when we talk about, you know, human rights due diligence, we only focus on, you know, we say supply chain. But really, you know, value chain, we have right from raw materials all the way to end of life of products. We have the ability to, you know, you, the responsibility to respect human rights, but the, also the ability to influence change. Um, and it's, it's really, it's important for our growth, I mean, to, to plan for the future based on, you know, this positive impact. You know, the more that society develops, the more that our stakeholders, and we've touched on that, uh, throughout the value chain benefits, it's only going to make you know business strong. Uh, and in this past year, I mean, I've really shown just how vulnerable global systems are. So you know, if we can bolster that you know resiliency throughout the whole value chain, that's that's only going to be a benefit. And you know, I think it just triggers better business practices. Um, hopefully, you know, we talked about transparency. We talked about reporting. Um, you know, the increased trust will increase better commercial performance if we can, you know, know and show. And, and I think that, that is a, something that sometimes is, a, is a downplayed a little, but I think extremely important. Um, some of the risks. Yeah, I mean, we talk about good legislation, a smart mix, um, but really taking this total value chain approach is, is again, really important. We've heard talk within the legislation of limiting the scope of it to tier one, to different sectors, to different high risk regions. And I think that really is kind of counterintuitive in a sense to you know, the purpose of human rights due diligence. It is to really to understand where your impacts are and to act on those. So you really to take a holistic view. I think you know, we touched on it also the inclusion of all sides of the business, small, medium, large, public, uh, private, into this. And also understanding that, you know, there are, how do you make, uh, you know, it proportionate to the size, nature of the business, the types of reporting that can be done. Um, so I think there, there is mechanisms for doing that, but we, should, we shouldn't limit it at the beginning. 
Um, <clears throat> the, you know, a directive rather than regulation, and I'm not, uh, I'll, you know, I'll never speak to that, but I think there's importance of this harmonization. Uh, we've seen it, Radu mentioned the different already legislations being developed in different countries. It, it really, I mean, as a business operating in the EU and then past that, you can really see, you know, the, the types of administration, different types of reporting, different types of enforcement of each member, you know, different states, really risks, you know, just diverting resources and, you know, positive impact that could come from a streamlined, harmonized approach. Um, but we, you know, we've been, we've been very happy to be part of the consultation process. We're, we are positive that we can you know, come up with a, a really good, smart mix in this, uh, good legislation. Um, we look forward to continue sharing our experiences. Um, well, maybe I'll, I'm looking at time, maybe I will uh, leave it there so that we have time to open up for, you know, other, uh, uh, other participants, other questions, and uh, take it from there. Thank you very much, Greg. Indeed, we do have lots of very good questions coming in uh, through the Q&A function. So keep those coming because we actually have just under 20 minutes to, to get to answering uh, your questions now. And I will try to, to with the help of, of colleagues, digest the questions. I picked up uh, one that I think um, can be directed to all of you to try and answer because it's one of the key issues as I see it. Um, and uh, I'll ask you, I'll ask you to try and, and answer it in, in turn, uh, maybe going by sort of the order of, of speakers we had. Uh, so Radu, to you first, I mean, this, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, one of the complexities uh, is situations where local laws uh, are in conflict with international standards. And now, I mean, increasingly, there is a conflict. Uh, and I, I tend to say that companies are increasingly uh, stuck between a hard and a rock, uh, between a rock and a hard place in terms of uh, following expectations, regulations, from their uh, home, um, where they're headquartered, so the, the EU or legislation in Sweden, uh, international standards that their consumers expect companies to live up to, uh, such as the UN guiding principles. And then there are local laws uh, in complex markets, uh, very uh, different political contexts, such as China, such as Myanmar, uh, the list goes on. What should companies do when trying to uh, comply uh, and respect human rights uh, while also uh, following and, uh, local laws in, in, these, uh, in these countries? Uh, Radu, do you want to uh, try and answer that first? I can give it a try, but you are asking the, the most difficult question here. I mean, we know that uh, the responsibility to respect human rights means two things. It means, first of all, to comply with domestic laws, and second, to respect internationally recognized human rights standards. When they are in conflict, according to the guiding principles, businesses have to um, act in the spirit of international human rights standards and to demonstrate the efforts they make to um, actually uh, respect human rights uh, in practice. I think that this, uh, there is obviously no easy answer how to solve this most difficult complex, but uh, conflict, but I think that this due diligence law can strengthen the hands of companies uh, when they make their case with, uh, with the host government, uh, trying to explain that it's not an issue of wishes or preferences or political values, but it's an issue of legal compliance for these companies. And they are answer answerable under a, a number of laws in Europe in their home uh, uh, country as well. So from here, I think the dynamics come and it goes into asking for the host state to follow uh, due process uh, involving other uh, uh, companies uh, involving uh, other stakeholders find ways to increase leverage so no company is left alone against a, um, a government that is bent on uh, 
uh, imposing abusive local laws. And of course, the last uh, solution is to leave the market entirely, but this is indeed the last solution because it can have unintended effects. Cecilia, what do Swedish companies, uh, do they, do they, are they confronted with this dilemma as well? I expect they are. Well, I expect they are as well. And um, just, uh, I was, I was, when I was thinking about answering the question, I was, I was basically, I think Radu basically answered it for me. Uh, I can just say that from the Swedish government side, there has been set out a very, very clear expectations on Swedish companies to act sustainably and responsibly when it comes to human rights issues, as well as other uh, types of sustainability issues in their, in their business abroad. And I, like Radu, actually believe that a, a, a mandatory EU legislation will help uh, because then there, there is something that uh, the companies can, can refer to uh, when they end up in, in conflicting situations. Thank you. Olga, do you have any examples of, of uh, cases where this has played out, these dynamics, and, and what, did, what did companies end up doing, and what are the expectations uh, from, from stakeholders in, in Europe? Thank you. Yes. Well, um, I think you know it's difficult. I, I, I can't represent uh, all NGOs. I think uh, uh, civil society has different approaches, and it obviously has to be uh, uh, taken into account that it's uh, civil society have different um, interests and different uh, communities and, and uh, stakeholders themselves that they represent. Um, if you don't mind, I wanted to. Um, add, um, address one of the questions uh, in the chat that I thought was very interesting. I uh, actually related as well with the scope of the of the legislation, which is how far should the um, the mandatory human rights indulgence go in terms of the tiers of the supply chain uh, to make it uh, substantive, as I said, and not another tick the box exercise. And I think, you know, it links a little bit with this as well in terms of who are these stakeholders, how far do we need to consider stakeholders? Because we are uh, we're establishing dialogues with uh, European trade unions. We're establishing dialogues with international trade unions and workers' representatives within our uh, very limited and very kind of sophisticated sphere in terms of uh, understanding of rights and obligations. But we forget that all this that we're doing with the mandatory human rights indulgence is to make sure that there's no violations at the uh, on the ground. So the worker, uh, the workers. And, and needs to be at the center of all these activities. So when we say, how far do we have to go all the way in terms of uh, this is not a, a corporate led exercise to minimize uh, corporate risk, is to actually minimize the impact on humans. So just to remind that the, the, uh, when we talk to companies, it's always all, uh, uh, civil, uh, sorry, supply chains are very complex and they have a lot of entities and they're very, they're complex and they're obscure by design. So the lack of transparency is an inherent element of the supply chain, which it is, and it keeps on being replicated because it, it in a way diffuses accountability and, and possibilities of, uh, of um, responsibility. So I always say this with regards to the electronics chain, the electronic supply chain, uh, all this, so many pieces within one electronic, uh, you know, a, a laptop, so, so deep, difficult to trace where they all um, are made. Well, they're not difficult to trace when you have to put them all in the in your computer to make it work. So, so black, this, this corporate supply chains delivers in terms of quantity, quality, timings, lead times to be able to um, address, uh, to, to make the product. So it needs to deliver in terms of uh, protecting human rights. So this is what we're in, how low do we need to get? We need to get to who needs to be protected. We need to get to the right home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. And yes, please, uh, other panelists as well, feel free to, to jump on, on any question in the Q&A uh, chat that you would like to address. I'm, I'm trying to uh, sort through them as well, uh, but please help me. If, if you see a question that you'd like to answer and that you think is particularly interesting and relevant, please go ahead and, and, and uh, answer it. But Greg, could you please uh, try and uh, uh, answer or, or address this question about uh, balancing the balancing act or the 
uh, choosing between international complying with international standards and expectations uh, and and complying with uh, with local laws which may oftentimes in in many countries where where multinational companies operate be in conflict with international standards uh, how how do you reason at ikea in those situations i think radu touched on exactly you know my first reference would be the way that the, the un guiding principles talk about how you you know, to respect human rights and, and in all areas of your business. I mean, in, in all areas of the world and and go back to this, you know, value chain concept. It is it is all areas of it. So, you know, working through influencing change, using your leverage. I mean, we've always talked about, and this is all, all areas, about being long-term in areas, using our influence, uh, creating change that way. And I think that's important. But to bring it back maybe to the conversation around EU legislation, I think that's why it's so important is to have this, you know, consistent, uh, harmonized way for business to, to work through this and those expectations. And then I think it's also important to have, you know, to, for, to focus on the business processes that, you know, how have we done our due diligence, human rights and environmental due diligence to understand where our impacts are and then be able to describe how we work with that rather than focusing on individual um, issues, but really, you know, how have you integrated into your business? I think that's, that's really important for, to get, you know, good legislation that, that really focuses on that and then puts the onus on us to describe how we work with it. Yeah, and I, I guess also identifying areas in which uh, you have leverage. I think that is also, uh, also key. Uh, so, I, I um, want to move on to try and answer at least two other questions in the chat. And I've seen several questions relating to the uh, the question on, on public procurement. So uh, one question is uh, formulated like this. I have a question about the link among public procurement, business and human rights and the missed opportunities to include this uh, perspective in the EU draft. Do you think there will be any way, uh, any impacts on public purchases? Why has this not been taken into account? Uh, do you think that public procurement is an effective driver to enhance and foster human rights due diligence in the global supply chain? Uh, perhaps uh, Olga first and then Cecilia. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, public procurement is essential and I think it is a missed opportunity and it will be even more missed probably when the commission uh, uh, takes, uh, has its take. But yeah, it's absolutely for, for many reasons. For reasons of policy coherence, following the, uh, the UN guiding principles, we can't be demanding of the public sector what we're not ready to do in the, uh, sorry, of the private sector, what we're not ready to do in the public sector. Public supply chains are the same as private supply chains. This is not just leading by example. This is actually, you know, undertaking uh, a state responsibility to protect human rights in every activity that it does. So um, I, the good news are that our international organizations are uh, taking this very seriously. The OSD has a very interesting project on combating um, uh, human trafficking in their own supply chain. Uh, the UN is looking into this. The work that has been done with the um, international labor organization is to how connect public procurement with uh, fair labor recruitment. Public procurement is so far from the from the uh, uh, these kinds of uh, it's so it's so little exposed to these realities um, uh, of abuses in supply chain that we need to start there. But yeah, uh, unfortunately, I do think it's um, it's a mess of in this case. Thank you, Cecilia. And and before uh, I ask you, Cecilia, to address the question of public procurement, maybe I can add one or two questions uh, because uh, there's uh, a couple of questions directed uh, to you. Uh, yes. So one, one is about national legislation in Sweden. What's the timeline for a possible uh, national legislation uh, on mandatory human rights due diligence in Sweden? And the other one is, to what extent will the proposed legislation influence and inform the EU and member states' trade partnerships around the globe? Do you foresee any impact of the legislation, legislation for states 
under the DSP Plus platform? Those are very good questions, all of them. Starting with, with public procurement, and, and maybe just in addition to what Olga said, that uh, sustainable public procurement is, is, is a larger issue than just national. Uh, we feel that, or Sweden, uh, the government works for it, uh, the public procurement to be sustainable also in the big uh, multinational, like in the World Bank, in the UN, where you have serious money uh, that goes in and that needs to be uh, sustainably procured. Uh, there is a quite an interesting example of the Swedish county councils who do, uh, in their public procurement, they've agreed on a common code of conduct relating to business and human rights that they are using in their procurement. So I don't know, Rod, if you have any, I know that they are participating in, in many different forums uh, on their way of working. I don't know if they're going to be part of this series or not, but they, as far as I understand, they, they're quite ahead of the curve when it comes to uh, incorporating human rights uh, requ uh, requirements into public procurement just as an idea. And moving on to the question on timeline when it comes to national legislation. Well, the EU legislation will be transposed into national law. So that will be uh, the process when it comes to, to Swedish legislation. Um, and the timeline for that, well, that's, that's sort of the, the 10,000 euro question today. We know that the conflict minerals reg regulation uh, took three years. Uh, we're hoping that this will be much, much faster, but it depends on. Uh, also, as it comes in the form of a directive, it might be a bit slower to implement in all EU member states. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. We're hoping within a couple of years, uh, but we're not talking months. Uh, this is going to take a, a bit longer than that until it's transposed onto, into uh, national law. I would, that would be my guess. Uh, in relation to trade policy, uh, well, you might know that it is part of the trade uh, policy review process within the EU Commission. So in that trade policy review, there is reference made to the coming EU legislation, mandatory legislation on due diligence on human rights and environment. So in one way or another, it will definitely be interlinked. And uh, not only in free trade uh, agreements, but possibly also in, in the GSP system but that is a uh, work in progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Radu, can I turn to you? Uh, and if you want to, if you have any reflections on, on the previous uh, questions, uh, but also adding one, uh, a question about enforcement. So there's a suggestion in, in the, in the Q&A chat that instead of, or in addition to focusing on companies of a certain size or for a, from a certain sector, shouldn't the member states make use of customs data to identify imports of products from risk countries? Um, yes, what do you, what do you think, think about that uh, suggestion, uh, Radu? Well, that's, uh, that's the, the trade question that uh, Cecilia um, started to indicate. When we read the latest trade policy of the EU from February this year, we see more assertiveness on the side of the EU and the willingness to use the size and the importance of the EU market. Uh, and I think that's the first time when I see it so clearly that the EU is ready to impose uh, product specifications and consider issues of forced labor, just like the US has a law on that, to restrict the importation in the EU of certain goods produced in abusive ways. Um, and this assertiveness, I think it's quite fundamental. Greg mentioned before that who is going to be covered by this uh, uh, EU instrument, not only European multinationals, but uh, companies uh, incorporated outside the EU and uh, exporting to the EU market. So we start to, to see these discussions about using customs border restrictions in a way that 10, 15 years would have looked like protectionism and would have been against the entire trade facilitation, trade liberalization discussion. Things have changed, uh, the geopolitics that you mentioned in the beginning have changed, and this is just one instance. Thank you very much. Then uh, a final question, uh, I think to, to Cecilia before we have to wrap up, but I, I should say also before we wrap up that we will 
uh, we really, really appreciate the interest and the questions, and we will pick up these questions in the forthcoming webinars that we do in, in May and June. So your questions are not wasted on us. Um, so uh, Cecilia, a last question, um, or, or if any one of the other speakers know, whether the EU has allies to move forward this initiative among developing countries. Are there specific countries supporting these in, this initiative outside of the EU? Uh, do you know Do you know any countries? Uh, Cecilia, what about your colleagues around the world? Well, so far I have not had any feedback that there are any specific countries who are who are supporting it uh, outside of the EU. Obviously, we have a, a close dialogue with quite a lot of EU member states, uh, including those who have national legislation in place. And so um, I'd have to get back to you on that one. I'm sure there are, but I can tell you right now. Yeah, let's let's do some further research into that question. And sorry to everyone who didn't get their uh, questions answered uh, sufficiently. We will get back to those uh, in our next webinar in this uh, series of three. It's on the 17th of May. And then we will dive into precedents of mandatory human rights due diligence in Europe. The information about the webinar is on our website. So please uh, register for that. And one hour passes very quickly when you're having fun. Uh, so now it's 2 p.m. and I really want to thank you, uh, our speakers, for taking time to uh, share your knowledge and discuss these important uh, questions with us. And um, with that, I, I uh, close uh, the webinar and uh, see you again on May 17th. Uh, thank you very much.